What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I am your host, the Murphination. And before we begin, I really just cannot begin to thank you guys enough for the love and support that you guys have given to the Pokemon Sword and Shield in-game challenge run. That was the first challenge run that I've ever done for this channel. And, you know, being a strictly focused music education channel, I really did not think that that video would really blow up. But because of you guys, the last time I checked, it was at about 207,000 views, which is just insane to me. Thank you. And it's because of that love and support that the channel was able to surpass 2,000 subscribers, which is just mind-boggling to me. So thank you. I, I, I cannot begin to thank you guys enough for this. So if you've been watching me on Twitch for a while now, twitch.tv slash TheMurphination, You'd know that a while ago, I tried to do a Pokemon Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Water-type Pokemon. And needless to say, that run did not go well at all. <laughs> uh, we lost pretty terribly to Gardenia. But I decided to go on Reddit and just talk about my experience doing the challenge. And somebody by the name of Lily of the Rally suggested that I try out a new challenge run called the Mystery Dungeon Run. And I have a lot of nostalgia for playing Pokemon Red and Blue Rescue Team. So I was immediately intrigued by this kind of challenge. And I wanted to do one in Pokemon Sword and Shield. A game that is pretty flawed, but I think is still very fantastic and does not deserve as much hate as it gets. The rules to this challenge are actually pretty simple. The main rules are that you can only use four Pokemon the entire run and each Pokemon needs to be completely unevolved until you defeat the champion. That way, it's actually synonymous with how the Mystery Dungeon games play out. And to make this challenge even harder, I'm adding in a few rules as well. I'll be restricting the use of items in battle, aside from held items and Pokeballs, which I will need to use in order to recruit new team members. And I'm also going to be changing the battle mode to set and taking away the ability to Dynamax in this run. One final rule that I'm adding is no time traveling in order to get new team members. You'll see what I mean in a little bit. So about a week before I began the run, I put up this giant help wanted poster throughout a bunch of different Discord servers that I was in and on Reddit as well. And basically it was supposed to have people give me different Pokemon to use and what they wanted the name of that Pokemon to be. And I had about 20 different applicants, and I put all of them into marbles on stream, and whoever won the first four races were our team members. And those team members were Yuki, the Alolan Vulpix, Ted Danson, the Munchlax, Chad, the Dwebble, and Frostcap, the Snow Runt. Now, needless to say, this is not going to be an easy run. If you couldn't tell from the Pokemon that we have, we have a pretty big weakness to three types, fire, fighting, and rock. And since we're playing this in sword version, we have to go against gyms of all three of those types. And Cinderace, as a starter, gets a lot of those moves. He gets a lot of fire and fighting type moves, as well as some rock type moves. So I decided to make the challenge harder and have Hop select Score Bunny as his starter, which in turn, meant that I needed to pick Sobble, my mortal enemy. I've never mentally recovered from that. Now, one thing that I want to bring light to, uh, Sobble Squad, you have made yourselves known in my in-game trade run video. I, I understand you're out there, but uh, I, I have a really good friend of mine who equally hates Sobble just as much as I do, and he, he wanted to come on to the video and just share his opinion. So, if you'd please put your hands together for me. Hi, friends. My name is Andrew. I'm a very good friend of the Murphy Nations. He's a, <laughs> he's, a, he's a real handsome guy, real upstart man. Great opinions, cannot be wrong about anything. I think one of the things that really just drives me insane about Sobble is the design of the entire line and just the continuity of it. If you look at Sobble, 
It looks fine. But the main idea is that it's a crybaby lizard. Okay. Fine. It evolves into Drizzile, which looks absolutely disgusting. I hate it with a burning passion. Why does this thing exist? But it's still an emotional lizard, I guess? Like, it looks like a typical kid going through an emo phase listening to My Chemical Romance. But then why does an emotional lizard evolve into James Bond? I don't understand! It makes no sense! If you look at Grookey and Score Bunny, you can tell that they're going to be a football playing bunny and a drumming monkey. Why does it, a crybaby evolve into James Bond? And don't give me the retaliation that it's, oh, he's moved on from his crybaby phase. No! That's bad design. Inteleon looks terrible. It looks like a twig. I could snap that thing in half with my pinky finger. All right, thanks, me. We'll, uh... We'll come back to you later. Upon getting Sobble, we actually get our first rescue mission, which is saving a Wooloo from the slumbering wheel. Unfortunately, we actually did not emerge victorious, since some mysterious wolf-looking creature came out and attacked us. However, none of our attacks were able to connect. We became engulfed in fog, but Leon came to save us, thankfully. And just from that alone, I did not think that this was going to bode well for our adventure. After meeting with Professor Magnolia, we headed over to the wild area to get our first true team member, a level 13 snow runt, who's going to receive the code name Frostcap. She's a bit timid by nature, so she's relatively quick on her feet and really can't pack too much of a physical punch. This is a great nature for her because I was actually planning on making her a frost lass once we're able to evolve. So this is absolutely fantastic for her. Okay, I'm going to go to my boxes. Sobble. So long. <laughs> Get out of here. Trash Pokemon. Trash Pokemon. We sign up for the gym challenge and assign ourselves the number 420 because I'm unoriginal and not funny. And we ventured off into the wild area to possibly find some more of our teammates. We did run into a Dwebble just outside of Motostoke. However, it was just far too powerful for us to combat with yet. So we might need to come back and catch it at a later time once we get a few more badges. Munchlax was nowhere in sight, sadly, so our final stop was to venture off to the Isle of Armor, actually, in order to recruit our next team member, an Alolan Vulpix who will be codenamed Yuki. At first, she seemed interested in the rescue team. However, she needed to be persuaded a little bit, and after finding 20 different Alolan Diglets on the Isle of Armor, she was impressed enough to join the team. Yuki is going to be an incredible team member and might just be Frostcap's best friend in this adventure because whenever she comes into battle, she activates the hail with her snow warning ability. This is going to be integral in making it through the turf field gym and surpassing Milo and his grass types. Yuki is a bit sassy, however, so she takes special hits really well, but is a bit slow. Thankfully, while in the process of finding those 20 diglets, we were able to find a calm mint, which allowed Yuki's nature to be changed from sassy, lowering its speed and raising its special defense, to calm, lowering its physical attack and raising its special defense. Frostcap and Yuki did a bit of training in order to toughen themselves up for what's ahead, and we ended off the night with Frostcap getting to level 15 and Yuki getting to level 9, both of them learning the move Ice Shard in the process, which is a great stab priority move that allows us to get one final hit in before we go down. Our overall goal during the next stream was to head out to Turfield and take down the first big boss, Milo. But before we were able to do that, we signed up for the gym challenge and battled Hop right outside Route 3. And even though he does outnumber us a bit, having three Pokemon compared to R2, I completely forgot that he had Score Bunny, which had Ember by this point. Wulu wasn't that difficult to take down, but seeing that we had two Ice types against a Fire type, you can imagine that Hop did not go down on the first attempt. Surprisingly though, we beat him on our second attempt because we froze Score Bunny with Powder Snow, which actually happened in the previous battle as well. And I was pretty sure that Hop was able to thaw himself out with Ember, but he just never went for it. He stayed frozen until he went down. After Score Bunny went down though, Rooka D met the same fate. That was a big hurdle for this point in the run, but I know we're going to have to deal with his newly evolved Raboot shortly, so we're going to need to really prepare for that. 
There were a few trainers on Route 3 that provided a bit of a challenge for us, specifically this one girl with a Pancham that knows Circle Throw, but thankfully she did not really use that move too much, otherwise we'd have been in some serious trouble. The next few areas are actually pretty tough to get through, knowing that there's going to be an abundance of rock, fighting, and steel types, such as Roly Coley, Timber, and Galarian Meowth. But we're able to make it through Route 3 and the first Galarian Mine, and we eventually come up against Beatty and his rescue team. He outnumbers us as well, but at this point in the game, he has an emphasis on Psychic types, so Frostcap was able to deal with them with Astonish, even though her physical attack really is not that great. She does go down, however, so I send out Yuki to take Gothita and Hatena down as well. There was a bit of a panic though, because we actually activated Gothita's competitive ability, which doubles her special attack whenever a stat of hers is lowered, and we hit her multiple times actually with Icy Wind, so I was actually really terrified about that. Upon arriving in Turfield though, we got ambushed by Milo and his Wulu in order to try and make us stray away from completing the gym challenge. Okay, that, that didn't actually happen, but you guys know me. I need to give you the juicy content. Where's the juice? Give my son the juice! Upon arriving in Turfield, we got interrupted by Hop and Sonya in order to learn more about the Dynamax and Darkest Day phenomenons, and then we took on the Turfield Gym, where we actually found instant success. Until we actually got to Milo. Do not ask me how this happened, but our team of two ice types with hail lost to milo's gossiflor and eldegoss seeing as we couldn't dynamax we were actually at a pretty severe disadvantage here our first attempt was actually going pretty well thanks to yuki's newly acquired icy wind but we went for a few of those in order to try and slow eldegoss down so that Frostcap could outspeed it but even then we just did not have a chance eldegoss is just way too bulky especially when dynamaxed and it took our hits incredibly well and took down Yuki with some max strikes and Frost Cap with a max overgrowth. We considered some different strategies for our next plan of attack while doing some grinding, and one idea that I had was to teach Yuki Light Screen, a move that raises our special defense stat for 5 turns, and also training Frost Cap to level 20 so that she can learn Protect. Kinda like in Sun and Moon, Protect cannot save you completely from a max move. Instead, you'll take only a fraction of the damage, and the effects will still go off. I'm hoping that we can try and use this in order to try and stall out Milo's Dynamaxing so that his Eldegoss can be a little bit more manageable. Unfortunately though, Yuki actually cannot learn Light Screen, so I spent $10,000 on a TM that we couldn't even use. We still decided to go at Milo though, and thankfully this went a lot smoother. Frostcap was able to take advantage of Protect to not only stall out Milo's last turn of Dynamaxing, but Thanks to the max overgrowth being set up, we were actually able to get some gradual healing from it as well. With the grass badge in tow, we were able to rank up our rescue team and recruit Pokemon up to level 25. So we decided to go and look for our newest team member, just outside of Motostoke actually, where we encountered a Dwebble with the code name Chad, and she was at level 13. She's a bit quirky by nature, which does not have an impact on her stats, but she came equipped with some great moves like Sand Attack, Withdraw, Smackdown, and Fury Cutter. She's also got the Sturdy ability, which allows her to survive any one hit, which can actually help us out in a pinch. Now, some of you might be wondering why I decided to just go and fight Hop and Milo before even looking for Chad, and uh, the idea completely slipped my mind. I have no idea why I didn't go and check first thing at the beginning of the stream. The weather also allowed us to go and encounter Munchlax, which can only be found in one specific part of the wild area in one specific type of weather, so he's incredibly evasive. Did I mention that he's only found there 5% of the time too? Yeah, this thing is absolutely obnoxious to find, but at least it's more manageable than trying to find one on a honey tree. Unfortunately though, Munchlax was found at level 26, which is just one level over our level cap, so he was way too overqualified to join the team. Hopefully we can actually find a way to add him to the team, because his bulk is going to be greatly beneficial to our cause. And since I'm not allowing time travel, I'm not able to take advantage of the raid glitch and try and find a rare raid where I can get myself a Munchlax. After some careful consideration about how our gym battle against Milo went, I decided to spend some time exploring the wild area in order to find some stronger moves for our teammates. 
Since we aren't able to traverse the water yet, I went around doing all the raids available in order to try and find some Blizzard TRs. Since Yuki and Frostcap have great synergy with each other and the Hail, I wanted to buff that synergy by giving them Blizzard, which in Hail is 100% accurate regardless of accuracy drops or evasion raises. Sadly, we did not find anything, just a lot of Sneasel raids that gave us dark type TRs, but we did get the TR for X Scissor though, which I immediately taught to Chad. X Scissor might not have a secondary effect like Bug Bite or Fury Cutter does, but it's a solid 80 base power move this early in the run. I will gladly take that. The hot battle on Route 5 was actually a lot more doable, thanks to Dwebble. Rabbit was a lot more doable thanks to SmackDown, and because of that, we were actually able to get through him on our first attempt. I'm really glad that we have Chad, because that opens up a wide variety of coverage for us. Upon arriving in Hullberry, I decided to buy a full incense. This has absolutely no effect in battle, but it does allow us to have easier access to Munchlax by catching Snorlax in the overworld and breeding it. This isn't technically catching a Munchlax in the wild, but let's be realistic here, there is a very high possibility that we would not have caught Munchlax this entire run, given how rare he is. So I'm going to just roll with this, and uh, I hope you're okay with that. Nessa was as obnoxious as you can imagine. You can imagine that she actually took a few attempts, because the problem was Goldine and Aracuda took way too long to go down, and then by the time Dreadnought came out, it would hit us with a Max Geyser, which would activate the rain and then activate its swift swim ability, allowing it to just sweep my entire team. We just did not stand a chance at all. We had to grind everybody up a few levels in order to be successful, but even then it still took a few attempts. Since we did a bunch of raids during the beginning of the stream, we did have a lot of experience candies left over, so I used those to grind up. I'm not going to abuse them, I'm only going to use them whenever I feel we need to grind. By the time we finished grinding, Yuki learned Aurora Beam, which is better than Icy Wind because it lowers the opponent's attack stat instead of their speed stat, and it also learned Extra Sensory, a solid base 80 power psychic type move that can possibly flinch opponents. Frostcap also learned Icy Wind, and Chad got Rock Slide, which is going to help us a ton against the upcoming gym leader, Kabu. We were actually roughly around level 30 on our successful attempt against Nessa. Yuki was actually able to take out most of her Pokemon with extra sensory, and the extra damage from Hail was a big assist for us. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't just flinch Dreadnought because flinching doesn't work on Dynamax Pokemon, so we had to rely on a few different forms of hacks, and that was Confusion and Attraction, which we were able to find on Route 5. I hate the fact that we had to rely on this, but I do not think that we could have won this battle at a decent level without it. And the best thing is, Dreadnought spent a ton of time being immobilized, which really allowed Yuki to weaken it down with extra sensory. But in the heat of passion, Dreadnought took down Yuki, which allowed us to send out Chad and then take Dreadnought down with an X Scissor. During that battle, Chad actually grew to level 28, where she learned Stealth Rock, which is an incredible hazard that we can use in battle, especially for Kabu and Leon. Basically put, whenever a Pokemon is quad weak to rock and they come in on the rocks, they lose half their health. That is going to be absolutely beneficial to us. On the 22nd of June, we were thankfully able to get two Blizzard TRs, although it heavily relied on us grinding out more raids in the Wild Area and the Isle of Armor, and then buying them off of somebody for 8,000 watts each. During that time, we scored a TR for Shadow Ball, which is a solid base 80 power ghost type move that can potentially drop the target's special defense. Frostcap can learn this, so I taught it to her, and since she's going to be evolving into a Frostlass after we fight Leon, this is going to be a great stab move for her. Upon defeating Nessa, we decided to go to the next Galar Mine and take down BD easily with a few Shadow Balls and X Scissors. We also took down a few Team Yell Grunts and met up with Kabu. And you can imagine that if I wasn't looking forward to Nessa, I was not looking forward to Kabu. He's got a Cantonian Ninetales, Arcanine, and a Gigantamax Scorch. We are really going to need to rely on Stealth Rocks in order to try and come out of this alive. And, like I was saying earlier, Scorch is a Fire and Bug type, so he's going to lose half of his health upon entry to Stealth Rocks, which will, in fact, be a saving grace for us. After a battle with Marnie in the Badu Inn, we go to challenge Kabu. 
I decided that my best option here would be to give Chad a Rostberry, since Kabu's Ninetales and Arcanine both have the move Will-O-Wisp, and seeing as a burn will ruin Sturdy, I wanted to give Chad as much longevity as possible, so this was essential. Plus, being burned basically halves my attack stat, which is not good. We set up our Stealth Rocks as Ninetales actually misses a Will-O-Wisp, and I decided to risk him going for another one and go for a Rock Slide. Ultimately, he decides to go for Ember, which does a decent chunk to us, as Rock Slide does a lot in return. Seeing as how I need Dwebble for Kabu's Ace, though, I decided to switch into Yuki, since that's probably what can take an Ember the best. And surprisingly, she takes them like a champ! Ninetales and Arcanine go down, as Chad loses her Rostberry, and out comes Scorch. I began panicking as the cinematic plays for G-Max Sentiferno, but Chad is an absolute Chad and tanks it, hitting a Rock Slide and getting us the Fire Badge on our first try. This thing is tough! You're in luck, workout is on CD. Okay, so he's going for his G-Max move. Sentiferno. Can we live this? It's neutral. Yes! Let's go, Chad! You, ju you just need to not miss. Let's go! Let's go, dude! First try! Oh my god! You could not believe how excited I was for this. I definitely expected to fight Kabu multiple times. After getting the first three badges, we can now head to the next gym in Stoan side. But on our way through Route 6, we actually lost to a trainer with a sock who swept us with a bunch of bulk ups, low kicks, and double kicks. I think I know who we need to avoid next time. Upon arriving in Stoan side, we actually have our next hot battle where he has a little bit more of a diverse team. He starts off with Cramorant, a water and flying type with the Gulp missile ability. Thankfully, it goes down to a rock slide, but we ultimately had to switch out Chad due to Gulp Missile doing a truckload to us and lowering our defense. Raboot actually froze again, and we were able to take it down easily, and then Silicobra and Toxel went down without a hassle. What is a hassle, though, is Stoanside's gym. Sword and Shield were the first games in the series to implement version-exclusive gym types. Technically, version-exclusive gym leaders were done in the past with Iris and Drayden from Black and White, although all they had was just the same Pokemon, just different genders. Regardless, in Sword, the Stoan side gym is a fighting type gym, and I'm not too sure if you noticed, or if that one battle against the lady with the sock didn't prove anything, but we're pretty goddamn terrible against fighting types, and B has an absolute stacked team this early on in the game. She has a Hitmontop, a Pangoro, a Surfetched, and a Gigantamax Machamp that are all absolute menaces to my team. We are definitely going to need to overlevel for this one, there is no doubt in my mind. But we can't even worry about that right now because we actually lost to the trainer right before her with a Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan multiple times! So that's fun! Like I anticipated though, B is an absolute brick wall that we are not able to get through at the moment. We were at level 36 when we first fought her, which is the same level as B's ace, and we just did not stand a chance. We can barely even get through Pangoro because Hitmontop takes out Yuki and Frostcap with revenge, at base power. They didn't even attack it beforehand. I went at her a plethora of times at level 39 too, even trying out the Attract and Confusion method again, but let's be realistic. Having to try that on three of her four Pokemon is just asking for it. I'm not that lucky. My only option here is to really grind everybody up to level 44. Here, Yuki and Chad learn some of the best moves that they're gonna have access to. Yuki learns Aurora Veil, which is a screen type move that sets up basically a light screen and reflect, but it can only be activated during the Hail Storm. Since Yuki summons it automatically thanks to her ability, it's not difficult to set up at all. And Chad learns one of the most broken moves in the game and franchise, Shell Smash, a move that lowers his defense stats by one stage in exchange for doubling his attack stats and speed. This is going to help us out so much in the future. Even at level 44 though, we still lose a few times. The goal is to set up Aurora Veil with Yuki and then have Chad come out as Gigantamax Machamp comes out. In our victorious attempt, we actually had some crazy luck. We took out Hitmontop with a few blizzards, Pangoro decided to go for Workup and Circle Throw instead of Priority Bullet Punch, meaning that he went down easily too, 
Sir Fetch went down thanks to a critical hit Blizzard on Frostcap's part, and then B Gigant maxes Hermachamp. I'm not looking forward to this. Frostcap outsped and froze Machamp with a Blizzard, and she never thought out. We had some crazy luck in this run so far, but we've also had some terrible luck. It's just genuinely insane. After defeating B, we're now able to catch Pokemon up to level 40 in the wild area. So I beeline, <laughs> get it, straight to the wild area and catch Snorlax by the bridge to Motostoke Riverbank. It's level 36 by default, so we had to defeat B in order to catch it. Thankfully it's a female, so I give it a full incense, after forgetting to give her one initially, and put it in the daycare with the Galarian Slowpoke that we were required to catch in order to give us access to the Isle of Armor. After some biking around, we got an egg and hatched our final team member, Ted Danson, the new mayor of Los Angeles. He's mild by nature, which lowers his defense and raises his special attack, which I was a bit upset with at first, but then I thought about it. Munchlax's special attack's not that good, but he's very versatile as a normal type, so I decided to keep it for right now. Once he hatched, we used up the remainder of our candies and got him to level 33, where he learned the move Body Slam, which is a great move for him. I'm not too happy about having a baby Pokemon on the team, but at least he's better than most of the baby Pokemon statistically. Afterward, we made our way to Balanlea, my favorite place in the game, in order to take on the Fairy Gym. But before that, I just want to give a bit of a public service announcement about the fact that we literally had a 24-hour livestream that showcased Galarian Ponyta, which showed my boy Impidim, and he was also shown at the original demo back at E3 a few years back, and they still never properly revealed my boy. Why did you have to do my boy wrong like that? I will die on this hill. I'm so sorry. You know what else I'm going to die on? You know what other hill I'm going to die on? My hatred for Sobble. So, uh, me, take it away, please. Hello, friends. Join me for a drink, why don't you? Those were Sobble's tears I just drank. I think one of the ways to really describe Sobble for me is hypocritical. If you guys think about it, Sobble is the reason why it bursts into tears in the cinematic where Leon introduces the starters to us. When Scorbunny's running around and Grookey's hanging up in the tree playing with that citrus berry, Sobble starts the whole commotion. Sobble literally shoots a water gun that hits Scorbunny, causing him to hit the tree, which causes the berry to fall in the pond that Sobble's in, which causes him to cry. It's literally his fault. It's his fault. And people defend this thing tooth and nail. They'll go to war for this thing, but I'm going to go to war too. Because this thing is a freaking hypocrite crybaby lizard that deserves to get punched in the face. Upon getting to Balanlea, we seek out the breeder with a Dottler, and upon defeating her, she gives us the incredible Evulite held item, which boosts the holder's defense by 50% as long as the holder is not fully evolved. Given that one of our rules is to remain uninvolved until we finish the main campaign, this item is going to do wonders for us. We decided to throw this on Chad so that she can be a little bulkier while trying to set up shell smashes and sweep. Needless to say, though, Opal was incredibly easy. Chad just set up a Shell Smash and also got all of her quiz questions correct, which made her Galarian Weezing, Togekiss, and Mawile go down easily. Her Gigantamax Alchemy actually almost took us down with a G-Max Finale, but Chad again was a Chad and hung on with 2 HP and took it out with 2 Rock Slides. She is such an MVP. I love it. After returning to Hammerlock and watching BD get his character development, we have our next rival battle against Hop, and he's got a more diverse team here, so he's a bit trickier to deal with. Trevenant goes down to a Blizzard easily, but I decided to switch Chad into a Pyroball from his newly evolved Cinderace, so that wasn't really a great move on my part. 
But for some reason, Hop just decided that agility was such a cooler move than going for Pyro Ball, which could totally take me out. He doesn't go for another Pyro Ball until I'm already underground, though, so he's kind of dumb. Chad unfortunately went down to his Snorlax after a few heavy slams, but Yuki comes in, almost taking it out with a blizzard, and then the hail had to take out Snorlax. Heatmore comes in, though, and we decided to switch into Ted Danson to set up a few stockpiles, but he crits us with a Fire Lash, so we need to start this over. Round 2 starts off the same way, with Trevenant going down to a blizzard, but I decided to stay in with Yuki in order to try and set up an Aurora Veil. This way I can get Chad in safely. Sadly, she goes down to a Pyro Ball, as Chad comes back in, but again, Hop seems only interested in spamming agility. Is he just trying to take me down with Gen 1 AI? I mean, I'm not a poison type or a fighting type, so... Whatever. But because of his stupidity, Chad was able to set up fairly well and just sweep the rest of his team. Upon getting to Sir Chester, though, Gordy was just as clean of a sweep as Opal was, if not even easier. I started off with Ted Danson as he led off with Barbarical, who set up a Shell Smash of its own, and almost went down to a Seed Bomb, but took out Ted Danson. Thankfully, the hail from Yuki took down Barbarical as we sent in Chad when he sends out Shuckle. We took this opportunity to set up our own Shell Smashes and set up three in order to maximize our attack and speed, and then just go for Broke as we get a bit low on health thanks to Shuckle's Rock Tombs and Stone Edges. Stonjourner and Shuckle both go down to a dig, as does Gordy's Gigantamax Colossal. It's a bit sad that we couldn't get any experience for Ted Danson, but this was still an incredibly easy gym nonetheless. Upon defeating Gordy, we have another rival battle in Sir Chester, and thanks to the hail that's automatically in play due to Sir Chester's location, we have even easier access to our blizzards being perfectly accurate here. Hop's team goes back to being rather lackluster, but he starts off with his newly evolved Dubwool, so we send out Frostcap to take advantage of Blizzard. His Dubwool wastes two turns growling us and then went for a takedown, but a few Blizzards took him down with ease. Cinderace came out as we switched back into Chad, thankfully avoiding the Pyro Ball this time. We set up a Shell Smash and took Cinderace and his new Pincurchin down easily. Snorlax came out and took us down with a heavy slam, but we send out Ted Danson to get revenge while also committing Patricide. Corviknight comes out and takes down Ted Danson, so we send out Frostcap expecting to lose, but Frostcap actually outsped, hit a blizzard, survived a drill peck, and took down Corviknight. Until we get Fire Punch and Winden, Corviknight is actually going to be a massive issue for us. With that victory, we ride our way over to Spikemuth and take on Piers, the dark type gym leader. He actually took two attempts due to his Scrafty messing us up with Sand Attack and basically just messing our whole strategy up. Otherwise, though, he was still pretty easy. We led off with Yuki using Draining Kiss, which is the TM that we got from defeating Opal, since it's actually quite effective against his Scrafty, a Dark and Fighting type. However, it doesn't even do half, and his Brick Break takes us out. We switch into Chad to set up our Shell Smashes as he goes for a Payback, and Chad uses x Scissor to take it out as Malamar comes out and meets the same fate. Obstagoon comes out next, and it doesn't go down to an X-Scissor, but he hits us with a Throat Chop, and we unfortunately survived on 2 HP, and then went down to the Hail, as does Obstagoon, though. His last Pokemon is Skuntank, so we send out Frostcap. We protect as he goes for Screech, and Blizzard does a pretty decent amount, and Frostbreath barely misses the KO, with thankfully a Shadow Ball taking it out, winning us the Dark Badge. Not a tough fight at all, but this just goes to show how one Sand Attack can basically ruin your whole strategy. With that, we head back to Hammerlock to take down the final gym leader and my favorite gym leader in the game, Raihan, who, as you can imagine, actually took a few attempts. The biggest issue here is that Raihan focuses on the effects of weather in a doubles playstyle, which is why I personally like him so much. But seeing as his weather setter is Gigalith, his sandstorm will come out after we set up the hail, meaning that we can't take advantage of our perfect accuracy blizzards. Our main strategy here was actually leading off with Frostcap and Ted Danson, and then once the sand was set up, immediately switch into Yuki to set up the hail so that Blizzard from Frostcap can have no chance to miss. Blizzard takes out Flygon and does a decent chunk to Gigalith, though. He sends out Sandaconda next while we go for Frost Breath on Gigalith, and try to take out both Pokemon at the same time with Blizzard. It doesn't happen, though, and hitting Sandaconda actually activates its Sand Spit ability, which reactivates the Sandstorm. 
but thankfully Gigalith was frozen solid. We go for a Blizzard with Frost Cap as we set up the Aurora Veil with Yuki, but just my luck, Sandaconda not only avoids the Blizzard, but also fully paralyzes Yuki with Glare. So our plan's not working out too well. Duraludon comes out and hits a Max Knuckle, taking out Yuki as Blizzard takes down Sandaconda and misses Duraludon. Literally? How could it miss? It's a skyscraper! Anyways, we send out Ted Danson as he goes down to a Max Knuckle, but Chad is able to come in with a final Max Knuckle taking down Frost Cap. We're able to set up a Shell Smash though, as Duraludon loses its Gigantamax form, and we were able to go for the Protect to see what he was going to go for, and he was going to hit us with an Iron Head. We go for Dig, and it takes out Duraludon in one hit. Chad is once again the MVP. On our way to Winden, we actually had a few losses to a few trainers on Route 10, specifically the one with Gigalith and Rhydon, but the biggest challenge actually on Route 10 was fighting the two reporters right before we got to Winden. We lost probably three times to them, but we had some crazy luck throughout though. During that, we actually had a bit of a big brain strat. If you've dabbled in competitive play, you probably know what the Crow Coon set is, and it's this set that you put on a Suicune with Scald, Rest, Sleep Talk, and Calm Mind. Essentially, the build makes you as bulky as possible by setting up Calm Minds to make you hit harder and take hits better. But Scald has the potential to burn your opponent, which, if they're a physical attacker, can actually half their physical attack. We decided to put this on Munchlax, and it can't entirely do that kind of set, but it does get Rest, it does get Sleep Talk, and we've had stockpile on Ted Danson for a while, which it doesn't raise our physical offensive stats, but it raises our defense stats at the expense of only being able to use it three times. So the set that we went for was rest, sleep talk, stockpile, and one coverage move. The reporters were actually still pretty persistent, but thankfully we were able to defeat them thanks to some good moveset choices. Upon getting to Winden, we go and take on the championship matches against Marnie and Hop. Marnie's up first, and you could probably guess how well this went. She was so freaking easy. We set up with Chad after she goes for a torment, and we were able to take out Lyperd with an X scissor. Scrafty comes out and swaggers us, which raises our attack to plus four, but thankfully we didn't hit ourselves, and Scrafty goes down. Toxicroak goes down to a dig as it toxic poisons us, and Morpico goes down to an X scissor as she sends out her brand new ace. Gigantamax Grimmsnarl. Dig does about half as a G-Max Snooze takes out Chad, and we send in Frostcap to stall out the final turn of Dynamax with Protect. Max Starfall does about a quarter to us as he sets up with Bulk Up twice. I was panicking a little bit, but for some reason Frostcap managed to outspeed at the last minute and take out Grimmsnarl. I don't know if we just had a random speed tie there or if we had a negative priority move, but uh, okay. Our next battle was against Hop, and he sends out his double as we start off with Yuki and go for an Aurora Veil. Sadly, we get paralyzed by Body Slam, but we somehow managed to survive a reversal while Dubwool was in the red HP, and Snorlax comes out. We try to hit as hard as we can with Blizzard, but it does like a tenth of his HP. I think his Snorlax probably has thick fat, so we decide to switch into Ted Danson to try and set up our stockpiles. But as soon as Snorlax goes down, Pinkurchin comes out, critically hitting us with a Poison Jab and poisoning us, which took us down. Yet critically hitting us happens a lot in this fight, so we have to go about this fight a few times. The second time around we met the same fate, so I decided to get rid of Sleep Talk on Ted Danson for the move Thunder Punch. Since there's really no need for us to use Sleep Talk if we're already maxed out before we even go to sleep. And I'm not taking a 33% chance risk for two turns that we get the one singular move that we need. Plus, this actually gives us a better answer to Corviknight and Cinderace if Chad goes down. Even with this strategy though, we still lose just barely. Cinderace always manages to have a sliver of health by the time we get to our last team member, and he just outspeeds us and takes us out. And we didn't have any kind of priority, so with that in mind, I retaught Ice Shard to Frostcap, and then we head back into the final victorious attempt. Double goes down to a few blizzards, Snorlax and Pinkurchin go down to a few Brick Breaks, Corviknight goes down to a Thunder Punch, and Cinderace goes down to some Brick Breaks again. Ted Danson literally held his own in that entire fight and tanked so many hits. 
That wasn't even that tough of a fight. Hop just really got incredibly lucky every time we fought him. After that fight, me and another Twitch chatter actually decided it would be best to throw Belly Drum on Ted Danson. This is a very risky move to have because it drains half of our HP in order to maximize our attack stats. But the plan from here on is to basically set up stockpiles to make us as tanky as possible, and then when we're good to go, set up the belly drum and rest off the damage. If we can set this up properly, we are practically unstoppable. Our next fight is actually against Oleana, and she... I'm not even going to sugarcoat this. We had to restart because she just stalled us out with my Lodic. The second time around, Frostlass and Serena go down to a Fire Punch, my Lodic and Salazzle go down to a few Thunder Punches, and her ace, Gigantamax Garboder, goes down to a single critical hit Fire Punch. That was a bit overkill if you ask me, but uh, let's move on to the Gym Leader rematches. We were supposed to fight Nessa first, but BD had to just come in and provide us with more of his character development. But it was still pretty easy. Mawile actually ended up taking out Chad, but that gave us the perfect opportunity to set up with Ted Danson. He healed up with a full restore, which allowed us to get a free stockpile off, and once we were all set up, it was all over for him. With fire punches in tow, we steamrolled through Mawile, Gardevoir, Galarian Rapidash, and his ace, Gigantamax Hattery. Nessa was up next, and thankfully we are much more well equipped to take her on thanks to Ted Danson's versatility. We decided to throw on Thunder Punch instead of Seed Bomb, since Seed Bomb does not hit all of her Pokemon for super effective damage. Thunder Punch does. She starts off with Golisopod, but instead of setting up here, I ultimately decided to go for the Thunder Punch to activate Golisopod's Emergency Exit, which has it switch out after reaching half health. Once that happens, she switches into Sea King, and Fear immediately struck when I realized that there was the possibility that she could have Lightning Rod, which makes her completely immune to Electric-type moves. In hopes that she doesn't have it, I still continue to set up with Ted Danson, and thankfully she does not have Lightning Rod, which allowed us to set up and sweep with Belly Drum. It was a bit time-consuming, but Ted Danson was able to take out Sea King, Galisopod, Barrascuta, Pelipper, and her ace, the new Gigantamax Dreadnought. Pretty easy nonetheless, but the rematch against B is not going to be so simple. No matter what happens, B was always going to be just a massive threat to my team. With her team being Halucha, Surfetched, Grappolocked, Phalanx, and Gigantamax Machamp against my team of two Ice types, a Normal type, and a Rock and Bug type, where three of the four Pokemon are weak to fighting and one is neutral, yeah, it's not going to go well for us to say the least. We decided to try fighting B once, and I immediately got my hopes way too high when Halucha actually missed a high jump kick the first turn. But even with a stockpile set up, it does about 75% health to Ted Danson. After we fell to another kick, we sent out Chad to try and set up a Shell Smash, and thankfully we were able to outspeed and take Halucha out with a Rock Slide, but Phalanx came out and immediately destroyed us with a Rock Tomb and Close Combat after setting up a No Retreat, which is an Omni Boost at the cost of... not being able to retreat. The writing was on the wall at this point. There was no hope for me winning this fight at this level, so we decided that we have to go grind for the rematch. Now, admittedly, that B fight worried me a lot. So I kind of went a little overboard and did a ton of grinding. I had a big concern that I would not be able to win this fight if I was lower than level 70. But then I remembered that Leon's team was all in the low to mid 60s. And since he has an absolutely stacked team, I went a little bit farther and leveled everybody up to level 75. I might be a bit over leveled, but we actually have some really tough boss fights coming up, so I'm not holding my breath. Round 2 with B actually starts off the exact same way with Halucha missing a high jump kick. We set up the Aurora Veil with Yuki and take it out with a Blizzard the following turn after getting hit to half health from a high jump kick. Phalanx goes down to extra sensory inhale while Grappolocked wastes its time on the field by setting up an Octolock on Yuki, who barely even had any HP left. Surfetched comes out next, and I decided to set up the Aurora Veil one final time since I knew that Yugi was going to go down, but apparently Brick Break breaks Aurora Veil. I mean, it's based off Aurora Borealis, isn't it? It's just lights in the sky. How can you break lights and colors in the sky? Hold on. Am I getting mad again? Well, I think you know who's going to be saying something, don't you? 
Hello again, friends. Would you have believed me if I told you that when I tried recording these before, I was not wearing pants, only boxers? I will say one thing about Intellion, though. While I think it's very terrible design-wise, I just, I don't like how skinny it is. It just, it does not look good. I will say that it, it has the best Gigantamax form out of the starters. I love how literally the only thing that really changes about it is that its tail gets really big. It stays the same size, its tail is just gigantic. And I love how it's literally waiting on the top of a tower with a sniper rifle. I think that that's actually really cool, but that's probably the only good thing that you will hear me say about Inteleon. Cause it sucks! I sent out Frostcap, and with a combination of Hail and Blizzard, Surfetched goes down. Outlast is her ace, Gigantamax Machamp, and surprisingly Frostcap lived on one HP from a Chi Strike. And I think it's just from all the grinding and walking around in the Crown Tundra that made Frostcap appreciate me a lot. As a second Blizzard crits and freezes the Machamp. Unfortunately, it thawed out on the same turn, but I lost my mind at that. I thought that we were going to have another repeat of the fourth gym battle. Chad came in and finished off Machamp, allowing us to move on to Raihan. Raihan was actually a lot easier this time. Since he's primarily focused on singles battling now, he starts off with Torkoal, who's more defensive than offensive, so we took the time to set up against Torkoal with Ted Danson. I decided to throw on Stomping Tantrum here, since it hits four out of his five Pokemon super effectively, but the problem would be his Flygon since it has the Levitate ability. After setting up and resting, Torkoal, Turtonator, and Gudra all went down easily, and surprisingly, even though I was only attacking with a Ground-type move, Raihan never thought to send out his Flygon as soon as possible. But since I can't do anything to it, I swapped into Yuki to set up the Hail, just for him to set up the Hailstorm. This gets rid of my perfect Blizzard, but an Ice Beam is strong enough to take it out in one hit. Outlast is his Gigantamax Duraludon, and Ice Beam does a pretty good amount to it, doing almost half as Yuki goes down to a Steel Spike. We switch into Chad to go for Shell Smash as he hits us with a Rock Fall, and then we retaliate with an Earthquake, which we actually got from a TR, and take out Duraludon. Those fights were actually pretty manageable, but our next fight was... A lot tougher than I thought it would be. <laughs> Chairman Rose is a Steel-type specialist, so obviously this does not bode too well for us. However, my plan was to ultimately set up with Ted Danson. Yeah, if only I actually tried to do that. My first time fighting Rose, I was an idiot and led off with Frostcap, and we somehow amazingly survived an Iron Head on 1 HP without the affection boost. But Escavalier just hit way too hard. You can put two and two together here, we have to go at him again. The biggest struggle with this fight are his first two team members. Escavalier hits really hard with Megahorn, which never seemed to miss, mind you. And if we ever moved on from him, he would send out Ferrothorn next, which would deal external damage thanks to its Iron Barb's ability. Our second try against him had us lose due to him setting up curses, and Ferrothorn took us out with a body press. We were able to get to his ace, Gigantamax Copperaja, but we lost in the end, it was inevitable. What really stung is that it almost went down to an earthquake, but it took us down just before the hail would have taken it down. Our victorious attempt had us actually not even bothered trying to set up against the Scavalier. We went straight for the fire punch as it took out a Scavalier and actually Ferrothorn with a crit. We did decide to set up against Kling Clang, however, because its wild charges did absolutely nothing to us and it was damaging itself in the process, making the sweep that much easier. After setting up, Kling Clang, Berserker, and Gigantamax Kabaraja went down with ease. Eternamax was actually pretty easy this time, and I know, you no longer need to remind me that Eternamax Eternatus does not count as a Dynamax Pokemon, therefore, Behemoth Bash and Behemoth Blade do not do double damage. But, that's still pretty stupid. They do way too much damage, and I still think that it should count. This was actually a really interesting fight for me though, because this was the first time I've ever done this fight after playing this game five times, where one of the legendary wolves actually got taken down. Zamazenta went down to a max flare, and that was just so surprising to me. Leon actually worries me a lot, because he's got some offensive threats like Aegislash, Dragapult, Haxorus, and his ace, Gigantamax Charizard. My ultimate goal was to sweep through as much of his team with Chad as possible, in hopes that Dragapult would take her down so that Ted Danson can come in 
and set up for the late game sweep. Since all Dragapult has are special moves, and even with no investment, Ted Danson takes those like a champ. Aegislash actually comes out first, and thankfully goes for the King's Shield, which allows us to set up our Stealth Rocks for free. We then set up some Shell Smashes, as he goes for Flash Cannon, which brought us down to our Sturdy, but an Earthquake takes it out in one hit. Haxorus comes out next, though, and Earthquake actually did not take it out, so Chad went down to an Iron Tail. We decided to send out Frostcap to take it down with an Ice Shard, and thankfully it picks up the KO, as Blizzard barely takes out the Rhyperior. Yuki comes out just to finish the job with Ice Beam, and Dragapult comes in, hits us with a Flamethrower, critically hitting us as we set up the Aurora Veil with Yuki going down. Ted Danson is able to come out finally and then completely set up with our three stockpiles and belly drum combo. Ice Punch is able to take out Dragapult and Rillaboom with ease, and finally out comes the ace, Charizard. This was the reason I set up rocks in the first place. It was practically our saving grace in Kabu's gym, and I've been planning to use it in this fight as well. After taking massive stealth rock damage, Charizard hits us with a max overgrowth, does nothing, and Ted Danson takes out the champion's ace with an ice punch. With that, the main campaign is finally over, and we're finally able to evolve our Pokemon now since we've defeated Hop. Now, normally, a lot of challenge runs would end here, but I like to end off Sword and Shield challenge runs with the final hop fight. So, before we do that, let's talk about the team and where they are right now. Chad the Dwebble evolved into a Crustal, Ted Danson the Munchlax became a Snorlax, Yuki the Alolan Vulpix became Alolan Ninetales, and Frostcap the Snow Runt became Frostlass. The only real big difference with this team, aside from their new and improved stats, is that Frostcap is now a Ghost type and gets stabbed from Shadow Ball, and Yuki is now an Ice and Fairy type, which gives us quad weakness to Ice, sadly, but now we get stab on moves like Dazzling Gleam and Draining Kiss. But now let's talk about that final Hop fight. Since we're playing in Sword version, Hop does not have the absolute threat that is Intrepid Sword Zacian. Also, side note, somebody mentioned in my in-game trade only run that I should have just gone for counter with Blue Bop on Zacian. Yeah, I don't know why I never thought of that. Instead, Hop has Zamazenta, which still hits pretty hard since it's a cover legendary, but its ability Dauntless Shield raises its defense by one stage. So this isn't as scary as Intrepid Sword, but it still makes it a lot bulkier than any Pokemon that we've fought up until this point. But as you can imagine, Hop was incredibly easy because it was just the Chad and Ted Dance in Variety Hour this entire run. He starts off with Dub Wool as always, and we let off with Chad since all Hop has on his Dub Wool are Double Kick, Cotton Guard, Headbutt, and Double Edge. So he can barely even touch us, which thankfully allows us to completely max out our speed and attack with three Shell Smashes. And on top of giving Chad the Rocky Helmet, Dub Wool takes a ton of damage every time he attacks us. He does decide to set up a Cotton Guard to raise his defense to plus three, but since we're plus six, Chad takes it out with ease, especially since it's at half health due to the recoil and Rocky Helmet. Pincurchin and Cinderace go down to an Earthquake, Corviknight goes down to a Rock Slide, Snorlax also falls to an Earthquake, and Zamazenta comes out, and we take it down with an Earthquake, winning us the run. A complete sweep by Chad, our true MVP of this run. I actually had a ton of fun doing this kind of run. It reminded me a lot of the team kind of challenges that Madrybred did on his playthroughs, like going through Pokemon Gold with only baby Pokemon. It was a ton of fun being able to go through this, and it really opened my eyes to different kinds of challenge runs to do. You know, the popular ones are solo runs, Nuzlocks, Cage Locks, Sleep Locks. This one really opened my eyes a little bit more and had me be a lot more restrictive and it was an absolute blast i would not be surprised if i did another one of these challenges sometime later in the future with that being said though i hope you guys enjoyed the challenge i know a lot of you guys are probably going to complain that you know this fight would have been a lot more difficult if i didn't evolve but honestly my plan if i still wasn't able to evolve was i would have just gone for the shell smash combo anyway and if chad went down i had ted dancing too so 
I don't think things would have been any different. But with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this run. If you did enjoy the run, I hope that you click the like button, comment what you thought down below, and if you try this run, let me know what your team members are in the comments. I'd love to hear from you guys. Be sure to hit that subscribe button down below, and be sure to follow me on twitch.tv slash themurfination, because we're actually planning on doing another challenge run sometime soon. I'm thinking we'll do a challenge run where we go through Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 with Klutz Golette, a sequel to our Pokemon Black and White challenge with Klutz Golette, and it's just an absolute joy to be able to do this again. Thank you guys so much. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and with that, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.